I think most of us are very sensitive to the fact that we are immersed in a pagan culture. And it's really rather fascinating to look around us. In fact, it's a startling discovery. If you start doing a little bit of homework and discovering that um, how much of our lives, the labels to our days of the week, our months, uh, go back to Roman and other pagan traditions. I think most of us uh, that have done any research at all, of course, know that Christmas is in fact deeply immersed in all kinds of Babylonian and other pagan traditions. The Christmas tree itself originated from uh, ancient tree cults. Um, the term druid may surprise you, uh, originally referred to a priest of the oak cult. And um, the custom of kissing someone under the mistletoe can be traced back to druid beliefs that sexual potency and other things reverence for that plant. Uh, Easter, I think most of us uh, probably uh, realize that uh, Ishtar was the um, uh, one of the, uh, the uh, goddesses of the Babylonian uh, religion, and uh, the golden egg of Astarte was uh, uh, a fertility symbol originated in fertility cults. And if you understand the symbol of the rabbit as a symbol of fertility, you can understand how both eggs and rabbits became symbolic of these ancient pagan fertility cults, and that's how you get Easter bunnies. I mean, you ever wonder why, where you get bunnies that lay eggs? You know, that's sort of a strange idea that we sort of take for granted in, in, the, in the various uh, 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 practices and games that are played around that time of year. And uh, so and it goes on and on like this. Um, the practice of sending Valentine, Valentine's Day cards goes back characteristically to a uh, licentious Roman feast called Lepercalia. Birthday cakes may have derived from offering candles and cakes to Artemis, an ancient Greek goddess of the moon and the hunt. The custom of giving out cigars at baby's uh, birthday, birth, may come from ancient Mayan fathers who would blow tobacco smoke toward the sun god as an offering uh, of thanks for the newborn child. Our childhood tooth fairy, uh, strangely enough, goes back uh, to uh, attempts to hide physical items uh, from practitioners of voodoo uh, who would use such items for their curse rituals and so forth. The idea of June brides uh, may, are, is related to Juno, the Roman goddess of marriage. Most aspects of the American wedding ceremony can be traced to ancient pagan customs, including the bride's white dress and veil, the exchanging of wedding rings, and the father giving the bride away. So there's all these, many of these ideas go back to pagan issues. And with that sort of, uh, you know, candid survey of the culture in which we live, once a year, we as Bible-believing Christians get confronted with a particular pagan celebration that should be giving us some difficulties. And that is, once a year, we face the dilemma, uh, the problem, the burden of dealing with a holiday called Halloween. And it's obviously very easy to shrug this off as just another one of these quaint vestiges of days gone by. But uh, it's interesting, uh, I thought we would tonight explore a little bit on some of the background that will relate to decisions that you're going to have to make this year again. The celebration of the pagan festival of Halloween is now a $2.4 billion market, merchandiser's dream. Over 50% of Americans will decorate for Halloween as compared to 80% for Christmas. It is now the third most popular party activity following only the Super Bowl and New Year's Eve. Halloween is big business. And I wish that was where it ended. It's always a difficult time, especially for Christians, and especially those with children. How do you deal with this? I'm also going to suggest that it's also a very dangerous time because many of the seemingly harmless involvements that tend to get associated with Halloween can be entries, the technical term used by some, for entries of the occult. 
And some of these things can prove very tragic for the unwary. It's interesting that you could easily make a list of superstitions and strange ideas that were extant during the days of ancient Israel. What do you suppose would be the penalty for someone who ran around the camp of Israel arguing that the world is flat? Probably nothing. You and I could probably conjure up a list of superstitions or weird ideas that were a, 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 a symptom of ignorance or being uninformed that were apparently would be dismissed as harmless. But if you were involved in something that smacked of witchcraft or astrology, or necromancy, trying to communicate with the dead. What was the result in the, state, in, in, the, in the camp of Israel? Death. Death. It was a capital crime. It's interesting that God didn't set those rather severe uh, punishments for ignorance, but rather for tampering, to protect them from tampering with something that was dangerous. And so I thought it would be fruitful for us to spend a little bit of time taking a look at the roots, the background of this holiday that is relatively recent as an American holiday. Um, and actually, the background of Halloween starts in uh, ancient Britain and Ireland, the Celtic festival of Samhain. It was observed on October 31st, which was the end of summer. In Cornwall, it was called Allentide of apple time. In Ireland, it was known as Gimbret. November 1st was the new year in both Celtic and Anglo-Saxon calendars, and the date was connected with the return of the herds from pasture, and the laws and land tenures were renewed at that time. It was one of the most important times of the year in the Celtic culture, and yet we'll also discover it was also one of the most sinister times of the year. The Celts were the first Aryan people who came from Asia to settle in Europe settling in, the, in northern France and the British Isles. The Celtic people engaged in occultic arts. They worshiped nature, ascribing to it supernatural or animistic qualities, very much like your federal government is enforcing in the schools today. You might reflect on that as we go. The ancient Druids were a uh, priestly class of the Celtic religion. Many of their beliefs and practices were similar to those of Hinduism. In fact, there's some very uh, uh, fascinating echoes throughout the Celtic religion of what we know today in the Hindu uh, beliefs. Uh, they taught uh, reincarnation and the transmigration of the soul, uh, pe that, that people can re be reborn as animals. That was a very common thought. It's common thought in Hinduism. It also was a common theme in the Celtic religion. Now, according to Julius Caesar and other sources, the Celts believed that they descended from the god Dis, which is the Roman name for the god of the dead. It's interesting that the Druids and the Celts venerated memory very highly. And as a result, they left relatively modest, if very hardly uh, any, written records. Most of what we know come, came from the Romans, which spent a did a great deal of documentation of these strange people in the British Isles. One of the things, just to give you just a flavor of some of this, one of the things that was very dominant among the Druids was human sacrifice. Now we read that very glibly, but until you get into the background, you, have, you haven't got a glimpse of what was involved here. According to the Roman historian Tacitus, the Druids covered their altars with the blood of their victims, often criminals, 
they were available. According to Caesar, human sacrifice was a common and frequent element. In large cages, scores of people were burned alive at once. The larger the number of victims, the greater the yield of the crops, was the thought. According to Lucan, a first century Latin poet, uh, three uh, Celt gods in particular were hungry for human souls, Tutatus, uh, Essus, and Tyrannus. The struggles of the dying victims were held to contain predictions of the future. The Druids had full confidence in sacrifice, human sacrifice as a method of divination. Quote, horrible indeed was the method by which the Druids divined the future events after a human sacrifice. The Druids, says Tacitus, consult the gods in the palpitating entrails of the men, while Strabo informs us that they stabbed a human victim in the back with a sword and then drew omens from the convulsive movements made by him in his death struggles. Diodorus says that they augured from the posture in which the victim fell, from his contortions, and from the direction in which the, flo the, the blood flowed from the body. From these, they formed the predictions according to certain rules left to them by the ancestors. So you get the flavor of these practices. These practices are still practiced today by certain Satanists and neo pagan groups. Now the Druids believed that October 31st, the night before their new year and the last day of the old year, Samhain, the Lord of Death, gathered the souls of the evil dead that had been condemned to enter the bodies of animals. It was believed that he would then decide what animal form they would take for the next year. The souls of the good dead were reincarnated as humans. That was the, the conceptions that they held. The Druids also believed that the punishment of the evil dead would be lightened by sacrifices, prayers, and gifts to the Lord of Death, Samhain. Now this begins to reveal the strange link that seems to emerge in later years between some of these Druid practices associated with Samhain and purgatory and some of the beliefs of the Roman Church, the non-biblical aspects of those views. Now the Druid worshippers attempted to placate and appease Samhain, the Lord of Death, because of his power over the souls of the death, whether these souls were good or evil. For those who died in the preceding 12 months, Samhain allowed these spirits to return to the earth, to their former places of habitation, for a few hours to associate one again, once again with their families. When, of course, at the close of that year, on October 31st. Now it was on these occasions that ancient fire festivals with huge bonfires set on hilltops were set up to frighten away the evil spirits. The souls of the dead were supposed to visit their homes that day, and the autumnal es uh, festival acquired a sinister significance with ghosts, witches, uh, gob uh, goblins, cats, black cats, uh, fairies, demons of all kinds were said to be roaming about. It was a time to placate the supernatural powers controlling the processes of nature. The hilltop Halloween fires of the Scots were called Samhanagan, which uh, suggesting again the lingering influence of the uh, ancient Celtic festivals. On this night, evil or frustrated ghosts were supposed to play tricks on humans to cause supernatural manifestations. And as part of that celebration, people donned grotesque masks and danced around huge bonfires to scare away the evil spirits. In some cases, food was put out to allow the good dead that Sam Hine had released to feel welcome and at home. You're beginning to get the picture of how they handled this situation. Halloween also brought, uh, was thought to be the most favorable time for di divinations regarding marriage, luck, health, and death. It was considered the only day on which the help of the devil could be invoked for such purposes. That's a strange superstition or thought that emerges in all of this. Now it's interesting, other festivals uh, throughout the world celebrate a time when the dead return to mingle with the living, it would seem. The Hindus had their night of holy. The uh, Iroquois Indians celebrate a feast of the dead every 12 years. In Mexico, the day of the dead begins on November 2nd, and on it goes. In Russia, all the witches are said to gather once a year. In fact, this is celebrated, Mazorsky's famous music competition, Night on a Bear Mountain. It's 
quite an, it's a delightful musical com music competition uh, composition. In fact, you may uh, if you uh, you may recall it was featured as one of the segments in Fantasia, Walt Disney's Fantasia, Night on the Bear Mountain, which celebrates this this belief or this legend or whatever that all the witches in Russia um, come to Bear Mountain October 31st and they revel all night and as the dawn comes they disappear and the music uh, very eloquently portrays that. Now it's interesting, here's a surprise maybe, in early American history, Halloween was not practiced. It was not widely observed until the 20th century. It was introduced by the Irish Catholic immigrants. They brought these ideas from Ireland. In Ireland, by the way, it's the only country in the world where Halloween is a national holiday. Now, in the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church in Europe, in an attempt to oppose paganism they in, uh, that was involved in Samhain, uh, they made, in order to try to offset that, the Catholic Church set up November 1st as All Saints Day, a day commemorating all the saints of the church. And the first evidence of November 1st as the date of church celebration occurred during the reign of Pope Gregory III, but it was in 837 that Gregory IV, Pope Gregory IV, ordered its general observance. November 2nd, the next day, was later designated as All Souls Day. You had All Saints Day and then you had All Souls Day, which eventually became a special day to pray for the dead. Now that leads to another concept that emerges here. In the late 1800s, it was customary for English Catholics to assemble at midnight on Halloween to pray for the souls of their departed friends. On November 2nd in Belgium, people uh, ate special soul cakes, all souls cakes, because supposedly the more cakes you ate on this night, the more souls you could save from purgatory. In Sicily, on All Souls Day, cakes with images of skulls and skeletons were eaten. In France, on All Souls Day, it was dedicated to prayers for the dead who were not yet glorified, in earlier times, the people took special bread called souls to cemeteries, placing on the graves. People ate these soul cakes because they thought it to be a powerful antidote against any flames of purgatory that might be invoked on the returning ghosts. At dusk, the festival changed from All Saints Day to All Souls Eve. Lighted candles were placed on the graves and in the windows to guide the dead back home. These are all uh, obviously ideas that emerge in those ancient times that get reflected by various things in Halloween. But we begin to understand as we look at this carefully how the ancient practices of the ancient Celts uh, get commingled with the Catholic concept of purgatory. And a Catholic uh, concept of purgatory, of course, is related to the Druid belief that the sinful uh, souls of those who died during the year had been relegated to the bodies of animals through gifts and sacrifices, their sins could be expiated and their souls freed from, uh, uh, to claim their heavenly reward. And Samhain, that, which is the name of the festival, also uh, some uh, scholars believe was also the name of the Lord of Death among the Celts, uh, he judged the souls presumably and decreed what form of their existence was to continue, whether in the body of a human being or an animal and so forth. And uh, so um, now in medieval England, the Halloween festival, became known as All Hallows' Eve, hence the name that derives later. And since it was associated with the, the, those in purgatory, the feast was abolished by the Church of England after the Reformation, but has since been revived in the Anglo-Catholic churches. And gradually, uh, Halloween, of course, uh, introduced to this country by the Irish immigrants in the uh, late 1800s, it gradually became a secular observance, broadly held, and many practices developed. Now one of these, of course, that you see uh, associated with this holiday is the jack-o'-lantern. It's interesting how many different ideas try to track that back. The, uh, the, it seems that the carved pumpkin may have originated originally as, from the witch's use of a skull with a candle inside which illuminated their coven meetings. That's probably where it had a beginning. However, you do encounter some strange legends in, among the Irish. You, if you do some research in this area, you'll encounter the legend of Irish Jack. Uh, he was presumably a stingy drunk named Jack who tricked the devil into climbing a tree for an apple, but then cut a sign of the cross in the trunk of the tree, preventing the devil from coming down. 
Jack forced the devil to swear that he would never come back after Jack's soul. And the devil reluctantly agreed. And when Jack eventually died, he was turned away from the gates of heaven because of his life, life of drunkenness and sinfulness and selfishness. And he then went to the devil, who also rejected him because he was keeping his promise. So as Jack was leaving hell, and it seems that he was, happened to be eating a turnip at the time, the devil threw a live coal at him. And condemned to wander the earth, rejected from both above and below, Jack put the coal inside the turnip, making a jack-o'-lantern. And eventually, pumpkins, especially in America, replaced the turnip. And that's one of the legends, Irish legends, that uh, they, they, they you know, tell the kids lying behind what we call a jack-o'-lantern. But it's a colorful, strange thing. But let's move on with the trick-or-treat and costumes. We sort of associate that with the, with the, uh, the celebration of Halloween. Among the ancient Druids, the ghosts that were thought to throng about the houses of the living were greeted with a banquet-laden table. At the end of the feast, the masked and costumed villagers would, representing the souls of the dead, paraded to the outskirts of the town, leading the ghosts away. Druid ceremonial participants also wore animal heads and skins to acquire the strength of that particular animal, typical animistic belief. Masks and costumes were employed in traditional shamanism and other forms of animism to change the personality of the wearer to allow communication with the spirit world. Now on the one hand we smile at these ancient ideas and yet I'm going to suggest before we're through that there is some serious, serious dangers in these games. Now immigrants to the United States, particularly among the Irish, introduced Halloween customs and they, that became popular in the uh, late 19th century. Traditional mischief making on this occasion was eventually um, replaced by the familiar small children going from house to house, uh, usually in costume, uh, calling for trick or treat. Going from door to door to seek treats may trail back to this druid practice of begging material for the great bonfires. And uh, they, to make the bonfires, the concept, they, 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 they had to solicit the materials. And also, uh, relate, this may also relate to the Catholic concept of purgatory and the custom in certain countries of begging for soul cakes regarding all that. Now, the trick part of trick-or-treats of Halloween appears to be derived from the idea that the ghosts or witches um, created mischief on the living if they did not provide the treats. Uh, it became very obvious to some of the people that had a sense of humor that this could all be camouflaged by playing practical jokes on, that uh, could be uh, uh, then blamed on the ghosts or witches, if you will. So that obviously, you can fill in the blanks. Some other aspects of Halloween that are probably not as obvious, the predominance of fruits and nuts is typically associated with, the, with the, this particular holiday. Three of the sacred fruits of the Celts were acorns, apples, and, um, and nuts. Acorn, uh, hazelnuts particularly. Acorns were sacred. Uh, associated with the oak. In fact, the word druid means priest of the oak cult. And the hazelnut was also associated with one of their gods. In ancient Rome, by the way, cider at this time of year was drawn and the Romans bobbed for apples. Dunking for apples became an aspect of romance divination uh, for trying to discover your, your uh, future mate. In Scotland, Young people assembled for diverse games to ascertain which of them would marry during the year and in what order the marriages would occur. There's all kinds, I'll spare you a rundown of all the details, but there's all kinds of usually apple-related divination among young girls. To, to, they believed that if you did an apple a certain way in front of the mirror on that night, that a, a, a apparition of your future mate would appear behind you in the mirror kind of thing. They, all these superstitions, get they're all sort of woven into uh, October 31st, etc. Now, as you, I find it rather interesting that as you explore all these pagan traditions that surround this particular holiday, it fascinates me that since 1965, UNICEF, the, an agency of the United Nations, has adopted Halloween as an opportunity to collect money for the United Nations Children's Fund. And um, you, uh, I haven't seen it uh, uh, in some of my recent years, but I gather you, there, there are from time to time, people go house to house, instead of trick-or-treating, they'll be collecting money for UNICEF. Sounds like a very appropriate thing, but in my mind, it's unusually appropriate for this ungodly United Nations to exploit this pagan holiday. Somehow that seems very strangely appropriate. 
I might mention, by the way, in my recent trips to Europe, I was rather startled to discover a practice that seems to be widely promoted among the hotels. When I checked into one of the hotels, in fact, this happened twice in two different countries on that same trip. I checked into the hotel, and, I, and my materials, when I checked in, pointed out that a dollar will be added per day to my room bill as a voluntary contribution to the United Nations Children's Fund. I was free to indicate on checkout that I objected to that and they'd be glad to remove it. But it took an overt action on my part, which I did take, of course. I have no objection to children, but I've got gigantic objections to the United Nations or any government meddling in this area. But in any case, um, I uh, uh, they gave you little cards and things, but the point is they have managed somehow to promote this idea that uh, in the billing, uh, they assume that unless you object, you volunteer to add a buck to your bill for this fund, which I found rather provocative. Now, as we proceed down this path of exploring this strange holiday, I can't resist pointing out the bizarre possibility that one of our planets is partly to blame for all of this, in a sense. As you study these ancient cultures, and not just the Celts, but virtually all the ancient cultures, you discover something very strange. They all worshipped the planet Mars. And uh, we sort of take that for granted. We see it in the folklore that these cultures worshipped the, uh, the hosts of heaven and so forth. The name for Mars in the Bible is Baal. It's one of the names, one of several names for the planet Mars. There's actually about 360 names in the Bible that allude in one way or another to the planet Mars. But um, it's interesting you look at that and you sort of shrug it off as ancient superstition and yet you stop and realize that these cultures were terrified of the planet Mars. Mars became synonymous with war. We use that same term even today. We speak of the martial arts and so forth. It's in our vocabulary. Now you and I, I think, would regard ourselves as a fairly sophisticated culture as far as space is concerned, as far as astronomy is concerned. And I would imagine there's not many of us in this room that could go outside and point to the planet Mars if our life depended on it. And yet these ancient cultures were terrified by the planet Mars. Why? Why would they care? And one possibility is that the planet Mars interfered in their lives. And uh, it turns out as you start studying ancient calendars, you discover some strange things. You discover that all the ancient calendars, some 14 of them that I've been able to track down, all were built around 360 day years and 30 day months. And you say, well, that's a good approximation, except they all were that way for many centuries until about 701 BC. In 701 BC, a large number of them changed. They changed their calendar. The Romans added a few days. The Hebrews added a month on some very weird formula, roughly once every three years, but it's not that simple. But all the calendars get mucked around. Rabbinical lit literature one, you know, ponders, why did Hezekiah add this month every so on this weird formula? No, correction, I beg your pardon. The, the, the literature ponders, why did he pick that particular peculiar formula? What they don't explain it's a mystery, is why did he have to change anything at all? Why did the Romans and the Chaldeans and the, and the Israelis and, and others modify their calendar in 71 BC? Now it turns out there are some theories about this that sound at first very strange. And that is that uh, 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 the discovery in more recent years as we uh, refine our understanding of orbitals, or orbits, especially with all the satellite technology of re in the recent decades, they recognize very quickly that orbits can resonate just like sound waves do with tuning forks or just like radio waves do with a tuned radio circuit. That orbits themselves interact with each other and thus have a tendency towards resonance. And the, the, the speculation, it's speculation, is that the, world, the Earth was on a 360-day orbit, Mars was on a 720-day orbit, it was in a two-to-one resonance with planet Earth. It turns out in these models, Saturn and um, some of the other planets are also uh, factors here, but to keep it simple for this discussion, 
the, the, they have modeled the, the, uh, uh, this theory, and just a theory, and it turns out that, that would, uh, the, the model implies that Mars would have a near pass-by with, uh, with the orbit of the Earth every 108 years at various times. Each time the near pass-by took place, there would be an energy transfer from one to the other that would adjust these things. And finally, in 71 BC, in one of these near pass-bys, the energy transfers were such as to stabilize them where they are today. The, world, the Earth has a 365 and a quarter day, nominally, uh, orbit, and Mars is now 687. And the energy transfers, the details are amazingly, uh, uh, they model with great precision. Now, what makes this provocative, one reason it comes up, is it if their model is correct, it implies that Mars passed near the Earth on a predictable basis. The degree to which it would pass may not have been predicted. That requires a lot of precision. But the fact that every 108 years there was a possibility, if Saturn was in a particular 90 degree relationship in these orbits, then Mars would pass very, very closely. And it turns out as you lay this all out, it coincides with a whole series of catastrophes in the ancient past, recorded in a variety of ways. Now, I won't take the time tonight to go through all that. We have uh, published a, a briefing package called The Mysteries of Planet Mars that attempts to go into this more in more detail. Now, as you explore these things, we, of course, got interested in this partly because it impacts our, the possibilities that might surround the long day of Joshua plus other issues. And so we've talked about this in the past. But as you explore this and begin to regard it as a rather fanciful, it's rather interesting to discover that these theories, colorful though they are and, and, and uh, embellished in very elegant mathematics, seem to be corroborated by uh, a guy by the name of Jonathan Swift. Uh, Jonathan Swift was an Irish satirist who um, his intent was, a very, uh, was to, to write very bitter satire on the government in London. The Irish did not have a warm feeling for England, and uh, Jonathan Swift wrote these, this fantasy as a me mechanism to poke fun at or to, to satirize uh, the, the situation in London at the time. And he wrote his stories about Gulliver's travels, which in which Gulliver has, makes a number of these, encounters a number of these strange places, and in Swift's dealing with this, he uses it to poke at the uh, problems in those days. But the point is, is that in one of these, um, uh, in his third voyage, uh, Gulliver encounters a place called Laputa. Not Lilliput, that's the little people, that's the first voyage that most people are familiar with. But unless you've been through Gulliver's travels, the whole thing, you know, there's some, there are some other voyages. Anyway, in Laputa, the astronomers in Laputa brag that they know about the two moons of Mars and the astronomers in London don't. Now, to give you a little background here, uh, Galileo did his things with a telescope in about 1610. And then Herschel, in subsequent years, discovered a, a number of the planets and, and made astronomical history over in the later, in the, in the, in the later uh, um, 1700s. It wasn't until 1877, not the 1700s, 1877, that Ace of Hall, using a brand new telescope at the time in the United States Naval Observatory, shocked the astro astronomical world by discovering that Mars had two moons. Some of the other moons were, had been well discovered by then, but everybody knew in those days that Mars was noticeably absent any moons, except Ace of Hall and the new telescope discovered it had two moons. Now the reason they're so hard to find is they're very small, like eight miles across, that's pretty small. And they're almost black. They have a reflectivity of less than 3%. But with this telescope and the improved optics and all of that, he discovered the two moons of Mars, made astronomical history by announcing this. Now, what's rather provocative is that, uh, incidentally, one of these rotates around Mars slightly slower than the surface speed, which means it appears to go slightly backwards, the only object in our solar system that does that. In Jonathan Swift's description of all of this, he describes their orbits and all that with a surprising degree of accuracy. It's not precise, it's off uh, 10, 20 percent. But still, that's startling, including the retrograde motion. So the, that can be inferred from that. 
So the point is, uh, what does this got to do with anything? Well, it turns out that Asaph Hall discovered the two moons of Mars in 1877. Jonathan Swift published Gulliver's Travels in 1726, 151 years earlier. And the problem is that the only way you could see the two moons of Mars would be if Mars passed close enough that you could see it with an eyewitness, as an eyewitness. And so the big conjecture among scholars is how did Jonathan Swift put that in Gulliver's Travels? One of the theories advanced by one writer is it was a lucky guess, <laughs> which I think most of us would dismiss as, a, as, as not too plausible. Um, did Jonathan Swift really know about two moons of Mars? Probably not. But the conjecture, and there's some reason to believe that he had access to some uh, Chinese drawings, uh, he apparently had access to uh, ideas that he probably thought were just legends, but he used, he drew upon those to, to embroider his fantasy, his, his satire, not realizing that those sketches and notes that he apparently had access to were actually notes from an eyewitness account of one of the near passbys of Mars, where Mars would have been maybe 70, 80,000 miles from the Earth on the passby. And so those are all conjectures, but the point is, this may explain why uh, on these near passbys of Mars, they would, it would always pass by either about October 25th or March 22nd. And it's interesting that the Celtic New Year was at the end of that month. And it's interesting that the worship of the planet Mars seems to be associated um, with many of these uh, uh, practices. The Romans had their New Year in March. And some of the near passbys would be in March. It would depend on some things. I won't bother getting into here. But uh, the January 1st New Year, uh, we are recognizing Rome in about 364 BC changed it to January. And the European nations at various times in the 16th, 17th century changed it to January. So the January 1st New Year, as we know it, was a later uh, arrangement. And, uh, but as we watch this then, as we look at all this, we begin to understand our biblical expressions where it speaks of them worshiping the hosts of heaven, which are, of course are detailed, uh, in, you know, I mentioned the Bible as a form of idol worship, a form of demon worship, and the rest of it. And yet, uh, we may wonder where that all starts. It, it was because there apparently were some reasons for them to be, to be very concerned about Baal or Mars, and that October 31st year-end tradition seems to be uh, tied to that. Now, um, getting back to our worshiping or, or, or uh, celebrating uh, um, Halloween, Obviously, there are a lot of superstitions that surround it, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, there are many people in many parts of the world that still today believe that particular rituals can have real supernatural effects. And um, the, uh, uh, there are all kinds of uh, uh, superstitions surrounding this holiday, and it's, it, it, these go beyond cataloging. But just a few of them in New Orleans, the Voodoo Museum offers a special Halloween ritual in which people may see true v voodoo rites. In Salem, Massachusetts, a Halloween festival occurs from October 13th to the 31st and also includes a psychic fair. And uh, now there are, as you start going on and on about this, there are many, many Christians that get really concerned. And I can't resist sharing with you uh, one incident occurred that Pat Matriciana, he's the head of Jeremiah Films and did, did uh, these very, very uh, well done uh, uh, videos on various uh, uh, pagan uh, uh, customs and so forth. Uh, Pat was on a talk show and uh, he was getting set up. It happened that he had access to a, uh, uh, a earpiece that was uh, connected to the instructions and due to some unknown crosstalk between the channels, he could, by ha having it turned up way high, he heard the director tell one of the other people, let's set this wacko up. This was during a station break kind of thing. So Pat knew he was being set up. And he thought, how, the only way to do this is take, you know, Pat, typically if you know Pat Matriciano, the, the, the thing to do is take the offense. So when they came back live, he threw out this one-liner. For a Christian to celebrate Halloween is like asking a Holocaust survivor to celebrate Hitler's birthday. 
Well, <laughs> he was on his way, you know. <laughs> but it's an interesting problem because we, are, as Christians, ha should have some real problems with all of this on the one hand, and the other hand, it's a difficult thing as to where do you really draw the line? What do you really do to, to not, on the one hand, appear like some kind of wacko, on the other hand, deal with this thing very directly? Now, let's go on a little bit further and talk about some of the dangers. You see, Halloween can be what you might call a crossover involvement in which innocent games can lead to serious entanglement with real witches, neo-pagans, New Agers, and other occultists. Now, one of the things that tends to show up around Halloween especially are Ouija boards. Now, I, how many have seen one or know what I'm talking about with Ouija board? Have you, okay, so it's, it's a common thing. Most of you are aware of it. You can probably find them in any department store. It was actually invented by a guy just as a business item. And um, it, the name comes from the word yes in two languages, we oui in French and ja uh, in German. And from that was contrived the label, for lack of something else, of Ouija for this little amusement. And of course, it is, uh, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with a piece of plywood with some letters on it and a little pointer, and yet used the way it's used can be what's called an entry. And uh, sometimes these things are used uh, as just practical jokes. Sometimes these things are used as, as serious forms of inquiry. And uh, you might, uh, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen, uh, read the book or seen the movie called The Exorcist. That's a, okay, we can use that as a form of communication. William Blatty wrote the story that they made the movie from. Now, what I remember at the time I was with Walter Martin on his board, and Walter Martin set out, he was very offended by the movie, and he set out to discredit William Blatty. But as he did his research, he was startled to discover that William Blatty had done his homework. That that novel, although Walter was always upset with the way he happened to choose to arrange the fiction, uh, it was based on a true case study. Actually, it's an amalgam of several, but it was primarily based not on a girl, but on a boy in New Jersey. And so it was, but the reason I bring this up is you, if you may recall, much, anyway, much of that movie did chronicle aspects of several of these case studies that William Blatty used as background. But the reason I bring it up is because what started this tragic girl down that path was her fooling around with a Ouija board. And these things are dangerous. Um, now, it turns out, by the way, that this game, the, the patents, copyrights of this of the Ouija board is an is a intellectual property that has been purchased by a company called Parker Brothers. How many know the company Parker Brothers? Do you know where Parker Brothers has its corporate headquarters? Salem, Massachusetts. I thought that would be interesting. <laughs> By the way, I don't attach any significance to that, but it's one of those curious things you can't resist sort of throwing out for fun. And by the way, it's my understanding, I haven't had time to do the full research on this one, but I understand that some of these other games, like Dungeons and Dragons, are every bit, if not more so, dangerous as providing opportunities to the occult world, and these are called entries. They are very dangerous. And these things go far beyond simply uh, innocent amusements and so forth. Likewise, astrology and horoscopes. Many people glance at the astrology columns that's carried in most of the popular newspapers as a sort of an amusement, as sort of a curiosity. You should recognize that the word of God makes it clear that these are to be shunned as dangerous. How dangerous? If you were doing it in ancient Israel, you would be guilty of a capital crime. That's God's way of getting your attention. But as I reflect, as I was doing some of the background for, for this, I was reflecting on those interesting days with Walter Martin. In the early 70s, we were involved uh, in a little casual uh, tape ministry, and we were publishing uh, tape cassettes of some of the more outstanding speakers in America, Christian speakers in America. We discovered Walter Martin. We published some of his tapes, and that drew us to be great friends. And we ended up, 
In those days, Christian Research Institute was in Wayne, New Jersey. And we'd bring Walter out here to the West Coast for speaking engagements. And Walter's style, we'd have him out here for maybe two weeks. And we'd book him for three, four, five days in a row uh, at typically St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church here in Newport Beach, and then maybe Granada Heights Friends Church uh, uh, and, and, and you know, a couple of weeks, and he'd be back to New Jersey. And he'd come out, and he did his uh, usual things. And, and he always drew a marvelous crowd. He's, an, he's just an incredible uh, guy and uh, very competent, did his homework. And uh, those of you that know Walter's Mar Min Walter Martin's ministry are, uh, uh, speaks for itself. And we became such good friends that my partner and I, uh, Don Rankin and I, uh, arranged to bring, have the CRI move from Wayne, New Jersey to the West Coast. Wal Walter really was startled and pleasantly surprised with the response that he would generate here in uh, the West Coast. So uh, he ultimately moved out here. But what I'm getting to, uh, Walter's classic book that uh, was one of the mainstays, still is to this day, is a book called Kingdom of the Cults. If you go to any Christian bookstore, uh, you can find Kingdom of the Cults. It's probably one of the definitive volumes on comparative religions. Walter was an expert. The book is a classic. And it's typically, it was packaged in a white kind of jacket with black and orange little, uh, you know, Kingdom of the Cults on the thing. Well, we did a tape series to match the book, and that was one of the main products that we helped Walter uh, develop and promote. But he decided he wanted to do a companion series of lectures on the occult. And so we packaged some tapes that, instead of being white, were black with kind of spooky, deliberately spooky looking covers, Kingdom of the Occult. And he came out here to, uh, uh, you know, to do the messages that became the tapes for that album. And, uh, we scheduled him, as we typically did, in St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. We have some of the people that were there here with us tonight. And Walter would fly out from New Jersey. He'd get here in the afternoon, but remember, it was three hours later for him. And he would we'd go to St. Andrew's. He'd get him checked in. We'd get, get uh, the new porter in. And then he'd, he'd go to St. Andrew's, and he'd do his lecture. And, and we typically did start Sunday night and then do a three- or four-night series. And the first lecture was Kingdom of the Occult, and it was just sort of a general introductory uh, uh, presentation on the occult. But he opened his lecture describing in rather graphic terms some of the bizarre experiences of this young boy in New Jersey. I can't recall whether it was the same case study that was William Blatty's uh, base or whether it was another one. But anyway, he, he recounted this story, really spooky story, got the audience's attention, then went on to highlight in that evening the dangers of the occult. And subsequent evenings, he took up special topics, witchcraft and other things. Well, we went through this series. We always had tape recorders backed up two or three deep because uh, it was a spiritual warfare situation. It was amazing how many times it was only the third one that was still working before the message was over. Um, as an engineer, you're very reluctant to adopt those kinds of hypotheses when something goes wrong, but uh, recording Walter over a few years made us uh, lay hands on it and pray, but in addition to everything else. Um, <laughs> Well, we got to, the next week, we were at Granada Heights Friends Church. That Sunday night. And it was going to be the same series, but we recorded both so we'd have backups. So we were there with our stuff. And Walter does the same message, except we notice, in fact, we're startled, is that what he does is um, recount on tape what happened the previous week after the series in St. Andrews. And I have to back up and tell you what happened. Walter went through this King of the Cult thing that night, and I was trying to get Walter free of the crowd, crash, because for the crowd it was maybe 10, 11 o'clock at night, but for Walter it was like 1 or 2 in the morning, and he hadn't eaten. I mean, he was, I was trying to spare him the pressure of a crowd. On the one hand, you want to respond. On the other hand, you're abusing the speaker. So I was trying to get Walter out of there. One of my associates had a couple of people along, a wife and a husband and a psychiatrist from what was in those days Jim Borer's church in Long Beach. And... Uh, my friend said, these people have to talk to Walter tonight. And I says, uh, Larry, uh, uh, it's just not, can't we, we got to schedule this later. Walter hasn't, you know, it's, we've got to spare him and all this stuff. And, and Larry says, trust me, he has to, and Walter overheard, he says, oh, I'm, I'm available. He says, why don't we just meet at my room in room 137 over in the Newport Inn. And so, fine, that uh, resolved the situation, it dissipated. As they pull up in the Newporter Inn, the other couple in the other car pull in alongside, and Walter knew something was up. He says, let's pray. 
And then they got out of the car, and the girl was in the car with her husband and with her psychiatrist, and she didn't want to get out of the car. And Walter says, they won't let you, will they? Well, to make a long story short, um, three or four grown men and this girl in Walter's room, New Porter Inn, experienced an exorcism that you would think came out of the Book of Acts. It was a spooky evening, many voices, uh, violent reactions at first, finally a feigned peace. Now the psychiatrist was, I don't recall, I don't believe was a Christian, or at least certainly not into this sort of thing. <laughs> But he recognized he was up against something that he didn't know what to do with. That's why they wanted to seek out Walter. There was a time at which the gal, everything seemed to be fine. They were expelled and all the good stuff and it was all ready to go. But by then, this is four or five hours later, it was a psychiatrist that knew it still wasn't finished somehow. Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, there was a classical, classic exorcism. Um, I think it was a year or two later, we ran into the husband and wife, and the husband confided in us that he had a whole new woman given back to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> what startled me, though, we had just gone through that that week, and here's Walter at Granada Heights Friends Church, and he's starting his talk, and then we realize he's not using the anecdote he used at St. Andrews, he's using the one that happened after St. Andrews, and it's all, tape number, it's all on tape number one of Kingdom of the Occult, volume one, if you can find that floating around. Uh, that's a, a, a classic. And uh, I don't know if Hank Hanegraaff runs those off, but it's around, trust me. Um, anyway, um, I can remember, it was in that era that we're talking now in the early 70s, middle 70s, 72, 73 time period, if my memory serves me right. There were some occasions when I would uh, travel with Hal Lindsey around Southern California. He was speaking, I was just accompanying him as a friend. But I noticed that Hal Lindsey, of course, would arrive, we, we had a situation where we'd have breakfast with a group and then we'd have an early, we went in one Sunday, we'd hit three or four churches at different services. It was sort of scheduled. He was very popular because of late great planet Earth and he was Mr. Prophecy and he would, uh, you know, do his thing at each of the churches. I was driving him. It was very interesting as we hit each church because after each situation, we typically would be ushered off into a little side room or a, or a restaurant or whatever where there was lunch prepared. And it was uh, typically the pastor and his wife and the senior elders and their wives. It was sort of an intimate group of maybe uh, six to 12 people in a dining room with Hal. And I would be there and, and um, there'd be the pleasantries and we enjoyed the talk, which was typically in prophecy and all this stuff. And then um, as things got into it a little bit, it was fascinating. The pastors didn't ask Hal about prophecy. This was a private meeting kind of thing, just to wrap with the speaker kind of thing. Sooner or later, it would sort of come up, the pastor would confidentially confide that he's facing something he didn't know how to deal with. And as you, it was funny, because Hal would just sort of listen and get the questions, but it got so you could predict what was going to happen. In each of these churches that we went to, there was someone in the congregation that was apparently demon-possessed, and the pastor didn't know how to deal with it. And I remember we'd, Hal and I talked a lot about that. It's very fascinating because the big issue in those days wasn't prophecy and second coming per se. It was that, that was sort of on the surface. The real gut issue behind the scenes was the widespread demonism that was arising in America. Now, I think these issues are uh, really critical, critical issues. Um, Isaiah, in many passages, says there's only one true God. Isaiah 44, 6, 8, 46, 9, a lot of passages. Don't have to chase those down right now. But actually, there's only one true religion. And the scripture in Psalm 96, 5 and elsewhere declares that the gods of the nations are idols. And we also elsewhere discover that the spiritual power and the reality behind the idols themselves involves demons. 
Let's take a look at a... Um, what are we doing on time? Yeah, we're going to make it. Okay. Let's turn to... Um, well, first of all, let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Paul says to, first Timothy, to Timothy in his first letter, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, notice that emphasis, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, giving their conscience, uh, having their conscience uh, seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from certain foods, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving by them who believe and know the truth, and so forth. Doctrines of demons, strange term, strange term. Where do you find Doctrines of demons. Well, very quickly, go to any Christian, go to any bookstore, not Christian, go to any secular bookstore, and one of the largest sections in that bookstore, because they're trying to serve a market, they're going to scratch where people are itching, but one of the most highest volume turnover areas in a broadly based bookstore is New Age, paganism, occult, witchcraft. Satanism, big, big, much bigger than the religious section, the Christian section of that bookstore. And many people sort of criticize these bookstores. Boy, they got nothing but New Age stuff. Why? Hey, all they do is stock it by what's moving. That's their job in their mind. In, their, in, their, in, their, in a sense, that's their mission statement. They're not making a statement. They're providing a service. And... Um, so you find it there. You find false doctrine, of course, doctrines of demons in the secular world. You find it enforced by the federal government in our schools, and increasingly so. But don't overlook the pulpits of the churches in America. Many churches have people in the pulpits that... If you examine the doctrines they're teaching, they fit 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and following. Now, um, turn with me to Deuteronomy 18. Let's pick it up at verse 9. Deuteronomy 18. Try to remember that chapter. You may want to come back here from time to time. But Deuteronomy chapter 18, starting about verse 9. The Torah says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abomination of those nations, speaking of the heathen. There shall not be found among you anyone who maketh his son or daughter pass through the fire. Any of you pass, have your son or daughter pass through the fire? That I don't think is a serious problem among this group anyway. But let's go on. Or who useth divination. Or an observer of times. Read that as horoscopes. Or an enchanter, or a witch, or a consulter of mediums. That's the quaint term. The politically correct term is channeler, or a wizard, or necromancer, one that attempts to communicate with the dead. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Heavy stuff. Heavy stuff. Now, you say, gee, that's a, a um, uh, you know, a past issue. Time magazine, a few years ago, 
made the estimate that there's 160,000 practicing, openly practicing witches in the United States, and probably about half that number in Britain. It's not an ancient thing for wackos or weirdos on the fringe. This happens to be a very sensitive subject to me because I can remember as a teenager, now that goes back further than I really want to confess to. I happened to fall under the tutorship of a very, very competent Bible teacher, a guy by the name of Ted Hacks, who was teaching in Southern California, a very competent guy that uh, I had the benefit of really being well tutored by him in a very uh, uh, excellent biblical background. And I can remember as an impressionable teen, my middle teens, learning the prophetic scenario, all the kinds of things that later, in the, say, say 1970, was popularized, if you will, by the late great planet Earth and other books. So I was well taught in that area, and I could visualize virtually those main themes. I mean, after all, Israel had uh, been reestablished in the land, and that was impressive, and, and it didn't take a lot of uh, biblical homework to discover that this all fit together. But there's one thing that I remember coming across that I had trouble with. Most of it I could swallow or see or feel or get a handle on, except one. Because the scripture kept referring to the end times, as prophecy comes to its fulfillment, that there would be an increase, a rise in witchcraft and sorcery. Now, as a double major, math science major, at one of the, uh, the, the really great schools at that time in this, in this part of the country, and I was well taught uh, uh, technically. Um, in fact, I think I coasted halfway through college on the background I got in those wonderful years due to wonderful experiences. But anyway, the point is, this idea of witchcraft and sorcery I had, I had trouble with because I, as a, a product of rationalism, as a, a product of the scientific age, all that sort of thing, couldn't see how that would, I couldn't visualize it. But I can remember vividly in the late 60s, as an executive back east, some events occurred that I won't bore you with the details of which, but I remember being startled by two things at the same time. I became conscious, as anyone was in those days, of the rise of what we colorfully call the counterculture at Berkeley and the rest. And, um, and th what intrigued me was two things that became, uh, I became aware of, perhaps a little late, and mo most people may have been already aware of them by then, but I remember at the time, I became conscious of this strange aspect of the counterculture involving not just the abuse of drugs, but their involvement with witchcraft and Satanism. And I remember at the time, I thought that was a little bizarre. It was sort of a fringe thing. Except I was a senior executive at Ford Motor Company, and I would traffic around the country talking to other senior executives of other senior companies, and I remember being startled, as I noticed, in many of the top executive offices, books and periodicals that were aimed at witchcraft. And I began to be conscious of the fact that in the intelligentsia of the corporate boardrooms, there were many practicing occultists. And I remember in my mind that was bizarre because I always associated that with ignorance or superstition or what have you. But then I also, about that time, for unrelated reasons, the Lord caused me to discover something I hadn't realized till then, and that is these passages that speak of witchcraft and sorcery, the word in the English sorcery comes from the Greek, it's translated from the Greek word pharmakia, from the same Greek word from which we get the term pharmacy. When you and I think of the word sorcery, we think of the medieval liter literary type of uh, uh, images in our mind. The word actually is translated from it has to do with the use and abuse of drugs. And the linkage of witchcraft in that suddenly hit me between the eyes was a contemporary emergent trend at that time. And I remember that caused me to sort of get startled enough to go back and dig out my old notes and start doing my homework once again. The, uh, this whole business of witchcraft and sorcery. Now, we've uh, sort of wandered around this subject, laying a little background for um, um, Halloween, because we're going to be facing it. And um, one of the questions is, and we could, uh, I, in the interest of time, I'll, I won't chase down all the uh, 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 verses. I think that there's so many in 
the scripture that clearly instruct us to give, to separate ourselves from any practice of the occult, but various, particularly witchcraft and such, that clearly is associated with Halloween. So one of the questions is that we're going to have to face, all of us, is what do we do? When Halloween's on the horizon and it's coming, what do you do if you have kids? How do you deal with it? It's very glib for us to say, well, we shouldn't worship it or shouldn't observe it, and yet at the same time we're faced with some practical realities. So let me suggest a couple of things. Um, let me tell you about another um, Halloween story. And um, October 31st story, I probably should say. And um, in Eisleben, Saxony, a baby born was born, uh, was born to a coal miner. And as he grew up and he observed the poverty of his father, this boy we'll call Martin chose to pursue a different vocation. He th thought coal, mine, coal mining didn't pay. So he decided to become a lawyer. Well advised, I'd say, huh? And in about 1501, he entered the University of Erfurt which, and excelled in his studies. He came to the end of his schooling in uh, 1504, and an event took place which changed his life. He's walking across the campus, and a storm broke out, a light and a thunderstorm. But it was an unusually severe one. It was so forceful that he fell on his face in fear. The thunder was deafening, and lightning was striking all around him. Instinctively, he cried out to the patron saint of the coal miners, a name who he had heard when he, in his childhood. He said, Saint Anne, save me from the lightning. If you save me, I'll become a monk. Well, shortly thereafter, the storm stopped, but he was a man of his word. So he withdrew from law school and entered an Augustinian monastery where he applied himself so diligently that he got a doctorate of theology in just a few years. But the more he studied, the more troubled he became. For although he became an expert in theology, he lacked peace personally. The question he repeatedly wrote in his diary was, how can a man find favor with God? And in search of peace, he devoted himself to an exceedingly pious lifestyle. He'd fast for 10 or 15 days at a time. When temperatures dropped below freezing, he slept outside without a blanket. Between his studies, he beat his body until it was black and blue and bleeding, that somehow by uh, punishing his flesh, he could rid himself of the thoughts and motives that he knew was not right. These were typical practices in the medieval church. He went to confession so many times a day that the abbot finally says, either go out and commit a sin worth confessing or stop bothering me. He became increasingly introspective and he continually was plagued by what he knew of his own depravity and sinfulness. And once, while sitting at his desk writing theology, he felt the presence of Satan so tangibly that he grabbed a bottle of ink and hurled it across the room where he thought the devil was standing and that, the, it crashed on the wall and left a stain that it still can be seen today. Well, finally, in about 1509, he decided to take a pilgrimage to Rome in the hope of finding this elusive peace that he so desperately longed for. And uh, so he set out on foot and crossed the Alps. On his descent, he almost died of a high fever before making his way to a monastery at the foot of the mountains where the brothers nursed him back to health. But while there, a wise monk approached him and said, you need to read the book of Habakkuk. And so he did just that. He read Habakkuk. A good suggestion. Habakkuk was a struggler just like Martin and like today. If God is good, why does he allow suffering? If, if there really is a devil, why doesn't God just obliterate him? I don't think there's any of us in this room that haven't pondered that at one time or another. One verse captured his attention. Habakkuk 2.4. The just shall live by faith. And... Uh, Having recovered sufficiently to continue his journey, the journey to Rome, he went on to the church of St. John's Lateran, a typical cathedral of that day. There was in that church a staircase that is said to be from Pilate's judgment hall. 
The, the existing stairs are in four parts. The outer two are ordinary, but the inner two are said to have been transported there miraculously from Jerusalem. The inner steps are not walked on. The pilgrims mount painfully on their knees a step at a time, praying as they go. The Pope had promised an indulgence for all who underwent this particular rite. As Martin repeated his prayers in the Lateran staircase, Habakkuk 2.4 suddenly became emblazoned in his mind. The just shall live by faith. He ceased his prayers, returned to the University of Wittenberg, and went on to explore this revolutionary idea of justification by faith. And on October 31 of 1517, he drove a stake into the heart of many of the prevailing non-biblical concepts by nailing his, 30, his 95 theses to the castle church door at Wittenberg, Germany. And he started what is probably the single most important in uh, event in modern history, the Reformation. He very appropriately did this deliberately on Halloween, on October 31st. His name, of course, was Martin Luther. Now, the leadership in that time didn't like the implications of his views, and he, uh, ultimately the Diet of Worms, the Diet is a council and Worms is a location, don't get the wrong idea. <laughs> Uh, they excommunicated him as a heretic. He went on to write commentaries um, that are classics today, and he wrote hymns like A Mighty Fortress is Our God and others. He translated the entire Bible into German that remains the literary classic in the German language. Now, it's interesting uh, that uh, in medieval England, the uh, Halloween festival was known as All Hallows' Eve. I think I've mentioned that and was associated with prayers for those in purgatory. The feast was abolished in the Church of England after the Reformation, but has since been revived in the Anglo-Catholic churches. Well, so that's a pause. I, I, had, I couldn't talk about October 31st without reminding us of an event that should give that day another dimension of celebration. So one of the questions uh, that we face is, how do you face the practicalities of small children facing this pagan and very occultic holiday? I think it's a gigantic mistake to dismiss it and indulge too far these very, very dangerous, potentially dangerous elements. But what do you do? Many churches organize a harvest festival with games and prizes, some kind of alternative diversion for the kids on this evening. And uh, these things are gaining widespread interest in, across America, and I think the very fact that people are starting to deal with this is encouraging. But there's some other ideas that I just throw out as practical thoughts. One would be, especially if you have high schoolers or kids that can undertake a drama, is to conduct a pageant or a play. And one of the interesting uh, things to consider is to put on a play called Saul and the Witch of Endor. There's a couple of ways to go at this. One way is uh, just to take them into, uh, what is it, 1 Samuel 28, and let the kids do their own research and write a play. A few years ago, we ran a contest, a national contest, for the best play. Uh, built around, you know, for, uh, suitable for high schoolers, whatever, around Halloween time as a pageant or play, call, and called the Saul, the Saul and the Witch of Endor. We had a lot of entries, and we had a panel of judges, which was chaired by Frank Peretti himself, and they picked the four best plays, and we, uh, we haven't, we, I think we have them all somewhere, but the point is, the four best are packaged for the, any, any money that, anyone that would like to promote that within their group somewhere, uh, it's available as an alternative diversion. Another thing that's also worth doing, uh, we haven't packaged a play for this, but it wouldn't be hard for a, an alert high school group to do their own research and write a play about Martin Luther and tie it to October 31st. That's another possibility. If you're in a situation that's more of a classic turn of mind, but not necessarily a biblical uh, thing, but still a desire to do something a little more erudite, I encourage you, there are other plays that are worth putting on. I encourage you to track down a copy of a, The Lady Is Not For Burning by Christopher Fry. Just a secular play, but it's provocative and, and uh, there are possibilities. So that is, uh, but I think the main thing I want to do tonight, I think most of us here are biblically sophisticated enough to know how to attack the problem once we are alerted, alerted to the problem. I urge all of us to prayerfully consider what you're going to do as you face 
a holiday like Halloween. It's dangerous. It's an opportunity to witness. It's an opportunity to do that skillfully with, uh, with maturity. But it's something I suggest you do consciously, deliberately. And um, now I have prattled on here a little bit, and we're getting close to the hour. That, uh, and it's been kind of a heavy evening. So I, I'm going to indulge something that I know I'll get some criticism for, but that's never held me back in the past. <laughs> One of the ideas that lies behind, see, by the way, to, to, just to, to stay serious here for a minute, the uh, cult is dangerous for many reasons. This whole issue of poltergeists, the whole presence of ghosts, these are all real issues in our society. The occult is getting popular. We have popular entertainments. We have Ghost Dad with Bill Cosby. We have the movie Ghost with Pat uh, Swayze uh, and Ghostbusters, etc. Uh, we have psychic hotlines. We have 900 numbers where you can call to get your psychic at a buck a minute or whatever it is. Um, and I, I know some of you will probably point out the Myers clinics are probably a close cousin of that. I'll stay off that one for right now. Neo-paganism and the New Age has become politically correct. So that these realities are serious realities. Part of the problem, not the only part, of it, part of the problem is that they deny the Christian worldview. They're built on concepts of reincarnation. They're built on concepts, in effect, that are close to the, the uh, non-biblical doctrines of purgatory and related concepts. And so they're dangerous, even just as literature, even as just ideas that are taken as just legends or culture, they are uh, attacking the biblical worldview. But our dangers go far, far beyond that. They also operate, there is a real spirit world, and it is hostile, it is active, it is, in fact, increasingly active. And, uh, but one of the concepts that comes across, of course, is this whole idea of reincarnation. It's amazing how prevalent that is in the Eastern religions. It's amazing how that seems to underlie so much serious thinking today. And Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto man but once to die, and after this the judgment. That scripture is often misapplied in some other ways, but the intent of the scripture, and clearly the context there, it is put there as a rebuttal to reincarnation. It is appointed for man to, but once to die, and after the judgment. The reincarnation is not a biblical concept. But whenever I hear about reincarnation, I have to be honest with you, I'm always reminded of a poem for which I'm indebted to Gail Irwin. And um, I can't deliver it with his unique style, but I do have to share with you his poem on, it's not his poem, he acquired, it's a, uh, we're not sure of the author, he found it in a, in a in retreats context and has, has used it with great effect on a number of occasions. And I thought it would be uh, a change of pace just to close today with this poem on reincarnation. What is reincarnation? A cowboy asked his friend. It starts, his old pal told him, when your life comes to an end. They comb your hair, they wash your neck, they clean your fingernails. And they put you in a padded box, away from life's travails. Now the box in you goes in the hole that's been dug in the ground. Reincarnation starts in when you're planted neath that mound. Them clods melt down just like the box in you who is inside. And that is when you begin your transformation ride. And in a while the grass will grow upon your rendered mound. Till someday upon that spot, a lonely flower is found. And then a horse may wander by and gaze upon that flower that once was you and now has become your vegetated bower. <laughs> now the flower the horse done eat, along with his other feed, makes bone and fat and muscle essential to the steed. But there's a part that he can't use, so it just passes through. And there it lies upon the ground, this thing that once was you. <laughs> now, and if perchance I should pass by and see this on the ground, 
I'll stop a while and ponder at this object that I found. And I'll think about reincarnation and life and death and such. But I'll come away concluding why you ain't changed all that much. <laughs> I can't top that, so let's stand for a closing word of prayer. <laughs> let's bow our hearts. Father, we just come before your throne because you're the only reason we're here. And we thank you, Father, that you indeed have brought us together. And we thank you, Father, that you've gone to such extremes to reveal yourself to us and to provide for our redemption. We thank you, Father, that you have seen fit to arm us from the troubles that are around us, the malevolent spirits that would undo us, the forces of darkness that scheme and weave traps against us. Father, we know that our intellects are of no adequate defense here. That we can only survive against these onslaughts, not by power nor by might, but by your spirit. So, Father, as we increasingly recognize the paganism that is rising around us like a flood, as we seek to protect our loved ones from its influences, as we begin to get a glimmer of the dangers that are around us, First of all, Father, we pray that you would bind the forces of darkness, put them to confusion. All of your children among us, we pray, Father, that you'd shield and protect and strengthen and encourage. And Father, you've also promised that if any of us will ask, <coughs> lack wisdom, that we should ask of you. And as we face the practical, practicalities of the coming months, we pray, Father, you'd give us wisdom so we could be effective witnesses for you, that we might move so as to protect our loved ones from these influences on the one hand and give us the wisdom and the grace through your spirit to do it in a way that will effectively bear witness of the truth. We commit all these things before you, Father, so that we might be more responsive to your will in our lives. That we might be more effective as your witnesses to a hurting world. We pray, Father, that you would give us boldness where boldness is called for. For we commit ourselves before your throne, Father, in the name of Yeshua, HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.